Steve Williams, welcome to the Dom Harvey podcast. Yeah, good to be here. And you're wearing, you walked up just before, you're wearing shorts, I would expect nothing less. Um, I've been researching you in the past week or so and everyone talks about how little clothing you like to wear. Yeah, well I don't wear long pants for one, <laughs> and, um, but um, I, I guess way back when it first started, um, Greg Norman's kids used to nickname me the Polar Bear because I never, ever, ever wore a jumper or a jacket, so um, yeah, when I was catting I just, you know, I, I don't know, I think... I think when you concentrate pretty hard, you don't even know whether it's raining or what's windy. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I guess it's just a habit I've got into. Yeah. yeah. And is it true the last time you saw Tiger Woods, he made a comment about good to see you're still wearing no pants? Yeah. Or so um, <laughs> well, I, I, I came this year at the LA Open, and um, I had to go to the hotel to meet Adam. Um, he was staying at the same hotel as Tiger, and I, and I, I walked up to the, uh, the driveway to the hotel. It was a, pretty cold it's in february so it was a cold night and whatever and that and tiger walks out of the hotel and he's got a big jacket on and, and, and beanie and so forth and i'm <laughs> i'm in shorts and a t-shirt and he just said just some things haven't changed oh, i love that oh geez we've gone straight into it but I, I should do some sort of an intro um steve williams for anyone that doesn't know is the goat when it comes to golf caddying i think in, in every sport you know the, the, the term goat gets thrown around like if you're talking basketball you can have debates about jordan Kobe, um, LeBron, whoever. But I think when it comes to golf caddying, like it, there's no question about it, right? You are the, the and, and depending on what measure you look at. But most most majors won, most tournaments won, uh, most years on the bag at number one, most income, whatever measure you want to look at, you're the goat. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have worked in a field that I love doing, and I've been very fortunate to work for good players. So you know, good players win tournaments. Um, it's very hard to measure. The success of a caddy because there could be some great caddy that's caddying for a player that doesn't perform well or never has performed well so he probably might not get the recognition i've been very fortunate to caddy for guys that win tournaments and um and, and win majors so yeah pretty fortunate oh, i noticed just in that answer there you um you said um worked for or twice why um what's the difference between working for and working with oh, yep oh yeah yeah, um, what would you say is the difference between working for and working with someone? Um, yeah, I, I guess when you say you're working for someone, you're referring to you, you know it's not long term because in the, in the world of catting, nothing's ever long term. Um, we consider five years on one player's bag a, a considerable amount of time. I, I, I guess that's, you know, when you're working with, you know, that's more of a long term kind of thing. But yeah, as it Catting is a five-year. Yeah. Well, we all in in our industry, we consider if you work for some one player for five years or longer, that's mm. considered a, a lengthy period. So, I have had four players of ten years plus. So, mm. yeah, you're a long-term relationship guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. no, it's like I, I understand um, you work for as and as and yeah, the golfer is the boss. And they could get rid of you at any moment. But work. You, you look at you and Tiger. Like I've watched a whole lot of footage over the last week, knowing that you were coming in, and um, it was a partnership. Yeah, no, I think we had a bond probably closer than any of the other players I'd caddied for, um, certainly because, you know, obviously I was considerably older than Tiger. And, you know, we, we struck a, a relationship where we both had, you know, the same kind of attitude towards seeing the same kind of hard work, dedication, whatever you want to call it. We, we, we just struck a bond that probably I haven't struck with any other player. So, yeah, we became very tight for sure. Mm. Yeah, it was, a, it was like a, the, you know, two worlds colliding at the perfect time, really, wasn't it? Yeah, because there's this footage I've looked at, it's like you didn't look like any other caddy. He didn't look like any other golfer. Like, you were the, you were the two fittest people on any fairway. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it was interesting when I went to work for Tiger, um, you know, I... I've actively kept myself fit catting because you've got to be with just the amount of travel you do and that and, and I, I love my running always have and, and swimming and so forth but when I went to work for him he brought a whole new meaning to the word fitness to me and um, yeah so um, but yeah he, he, one of his great beliefs was that you know the fitter you are the better the mind works mm. and the better the mind works the better success you had so um, yeah, the, there's a lot of truth to that, I guess. Yeah, 100%. Okay, um, so for, for me and probably a lot of people listening to this or watching this, what is the role of a caddy? 
very hard role to explain, <laughs> um, particularly when you try and tell someone that plays golf, let alone someone that doesn't play golf. But, I mean, everybody understands that a caddy um, provides all the information for the player. And when I mean the information, you know, all the distance is required, where the flag, the whole location is on the green, wind conditions, I- anything to do with playing the golf course. But but that's that's just the, the easiest part of the job. Uh, a caddy is like an on-course psychologist, uh, part caddy, part coach a lot of the times. Um, and, and, you, you know, you, you're there, to, you know, you, you both share an opinion. So, you know, you, you, you help, the, you advise the player on what to do, um, you know, you make a game plan with the player. It's a quite a, a caddy wears many roles, many hats. It's hard to exactly explain, but basically, you know, you you, you guide the, the player around the course, and you make a lot of decisions based on how he's playing, how he warmed up that day, and so forth. But um, the most difficult part of a caddy's job is when a player's not playing well. You've got to somehow get them out of that funk, whether it could be something to do with their technical stuff, you know, or something to do with their mental stuff. Mm-hmm. You've got to be a, a very alert to that. And be able to quickly change things because um, not every you know golf's a, an unusual game because every day is different. The conditions are different every day. The players different every day. They feel different every day. Every day is different. You know some sports. You know uh, most sports are reactive sports. You, you what you do is reactive on somebody else. But golf, you're hitting a stationary object, and there's a, a lot goes into it. So, mm. but yeah, basically you know you got you, you're there to advise the player, but also you've got to be what uh, what makes a good caddy is that someone. Um, that has the ability to override a player's decision and, and convince them that the caddy's right because you know that's just what you do. You, you you're you're employed to, you know, know that game, that guy's or girl's game inside out. So yeah, it's quite a complex job. That's a, that's a lot of pressure speaking up, overriding a player's decision. Yeah, hey, you're putting your nuts on the line. Really. Yep, and that's um, probably where my success has come from because I, I I've had no problem in major moments in big golf tournaments to override a player and convince them I'm right. And probably when I, I go back to the very first year I came for Tiger, obviously when I met Tiger, um, he was instrumental in telling me what his goals were. Obviously his biggest focus, his biggest goal was to break Jack Nicklaus's record of 18 majors. He wanted to get to 19 and, and surpass Jack. Um, and um, he... he yeah, that that was his big goal. So, in the very first year I came from, I could feel the stress already in these major championships with him because he wasn't playing that well. And then, and in, and in, in, in I joined him in nineteen ninety nine, the last major year of the PGA Championship at Medina. Um, he had a chance to win that tournament. We got to the sixteenth hole, it's a par three, and he had a like a six foot putt there, and he said, "Steve, can you read this one?" And and, I, and he said, I think it's outside the hole, left side. And I said, no, it's inside the hole, Tiger. And I, I was firm and committed that that's how I saw it, that's where I thought. And he hit the putt and hold that putt. And that was the moment, like, where that trust for the next 13 years was, was you know, that's where it was in, in, <laughs> instigated. You know, because if I was wrong, you know, that, you know, like, when a player wins, his, he won his first major, but trying to win the second major is, is more difficult than the first one. Um, and you know, you could look now like Rory McIlroy hasn't won a major for you know quite considerable time. It's like him trying to win his next one. It's very difficult. So when Tiger won the Masters, uh, sorry, the PGA on the '99, that sort of that was the stepping stone to our success for sure. Because what, what what if you were right about that part and he he fucked up the shot? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, exactly. You, you don't know, so that, that's the case. But I mean, he, you know, he hit the perfect, he hit exactly where I said, and it went. And you know, if he had to hit it where he thought outside the hole, um, you know, he wouldn't have won that, won the PGA. Mm. So, but that's you know, he 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 loved that moment that I, I overrode what he said and said to him, I'm a hundred percent confident that this putt is inside the hole and he hold it, and uh, yeah. How oh, good. Yeah, yeah, that was that was. Oh, good. You, you tell that story like it was just yesterday. Yeah, well, I've had, you know, I, I, there's three or four defining moments. Obviously, you know, I think the one that's became very evident was when I, when Adam Scott won the Masters in 2013 in the playoff hole. Um, you know, we got there on the second playoff hole. It was rainy and dark and so forth. Anyway, uh, when we were walking up to the green, I knew, well, I didn't, I was going to tell him, I was going to read the putt whether he asked me or not because I knew that he wouldn't know how much this putt 
broke because I knew he would never have had this putt um, in the, at Augusta. The second hole of the playoff was the 10th hole, and the pin on the Sundays there is always in the back part of the green that. But when you play there, you always hit it to the middle of the green because if you go over the green, you, you can't get up and down there. You can make five, six, whatever. Anyway, so we got up there, and he said, oh, Steve, can you read the putt and everything? And you know, he read the putt, and I, he said, I think it's a cup out. You know, one hole out to the right. And in my exact words, that, that isn't even fucking close, Adam. It's two and a half <laughs> cups. So he underread that putt by a cup and a half. And, of course, he hold the putt um, and, and, you know, won the Masters. So, yeah, that was a, you know, like a, an amazing moment because here's a guy that's desperate to win his first major but also desperate to become the first Australian to put on the green jacket. Mm. And the most amazing thing about that is the very first phone call uh, after I'd spoken to my lovely wife um, that I got when I was driving back to the house was Greg Norman. And he exactly read my lips of what I said. And the, the, the iconic thing about it is that I remember that putt. Greg had it one year. It's the only other time I, that, I, that someone I'd care for it had that putt on the 10th hole, pin high to the right, because you're always putting straight up the hill because that's where you're supposed to play the hole. So that's how you, you knew that hole intimately. Yeah, and that was that was going back into the eighties. So this was two thousand and thirteen, and I had a memory. I think with my, you know, I don't know, it was in the eighties. That's so. That's how long I'd remembered that putt broke more than it looks. Amazing, amazing. Oh, I was going to get to the um, the Adam Scott stuff, but since since we're there now, I do, do want to ask you about that because um, after that tournament that he won, uh, you you made a comment which was seen as controversial at the time. You said uh, something like this: "This this means more to me than any other major," and a lot of people saw that as a dig at Tiger. I, I personally didn't. I, I knew exactly what you meant. Like, you knew how big it was going to be for Australia. You know how big it was for Adam Scott. Um, I mean, shit, here in New Zealand, we're still talking about Bob Charles winning the British Open 70 years ago or whatever. Um, but, yeah, did you sort of feel the heat of that comment? Oh, look, I mean... <laughs> not that you give a shit. But. No, it's, it's not so much that. But, like, you know, at, at, at the you know, in that particular moment and in in the excitement of what's going on and, and the thrill of winning the Masters, and especially knowing that he's the first Australian to win it, and I'd yeah. been on Greg Norman's bag a couple of times as a major heartbreak on the 18th hold, Augusta, and, you know, no Australians won that tournament. I, I just know what it means to you know, At the time, yeah, I, I said it. And, you know, look, it'd be, it'd certainly be in my top two. You know, I said it at the time it was my top one, but it was, it's in my top two. So, but, um, hey, look, I mean, you know, the media love to, to, to add their twist to anything. I, you know, I, I understand how that works. Yeah, no, no, no I, I knew exactly what you meant, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, okay, let's go back to the early years. So, um, where are you from? You're from Parapara Umu? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, famous golf course there. Actually, were you part of the reason that Tiger came for the NZ Open that year? Yeah, Did absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, um, each time that I've caddied for a player, and you know, you negotiate a contract or however you're going to do, and I always say that if you win a major, you've got to come and play in the New Zealand Open. And. I said that to Tiger the very first day that I met him, and we just, not met him, but the first time that we sat down and discussed caddying for him, I said that to him. And after he won the, uh, the major, that was the first thing he said, when am I playing in the New Zealand Open? So, I, you know, hats off to the guy, like, mm. you know, straight away for honouring that commitment. So that was pretty, yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah, so, so what did the early years look like? You, you used to caddy for your dad and his mates. Yeah, like, I, I mean... But not, not, I can see at that age, it's not... What age are we talking? I, I, I've carried at the golf club at Parapara Umu since I was about seven years old. Right. So It's just carrying a bag though, isn't it? Not really caddying. Yeah, um, but but even amazingly, I had some kind of knack for it because a lot of the players at the golf course, uh, uh, from memory, it's hard to think that long ago, but I, you know, I think we as caddies at the golf course, we were getting $2 a round and there were several members that would pay me $5 a round because they wanted me to carry for them. I had a bit of a knack for being able to judge distances and select clubs and so forth um, without actually knowing exactly how far it was. Um, you know, there was no such thing as a, like we use range finders now or any kind of measuring device. It was just all done by feel. And I had a very good feel. It just something I had a knack for. And, you know, through time, that $5 became $10 and that $10 became $20. And, you know, I carried. The growth was exponential later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I carried at the golf course every weekend, um, thirty six holes. You know, every Saturday, every Sunday, and I, and I just I, I 
I played golf as a kid, and uh, but I enjoyed caddying just as much. And then, you know, obviously, I had the opportunity uh, in 1976 to caddy for Peter Thompson um, at the New Zealand Open at Heratonga. My father organised that because he knew Peter. He'd played in the Caltex tournament at Paraparu Umu a couple of times, and he'd met Peter Thompson, and um, he asked Peter, you know, my son loves to caddy. He's only 13 years of age. Could he caddy for New Zealand Open? And Peter said, sure. Yeah, now, I, I wasn't familiar with this name. I feel very naive about this. But he's, he's won the British Open five times, Peter yeah, Thompson. Yeah, Peter Thompson. So he was a big deal. Yeah, oh, yeah. he, he was a, a guy that came to New Zealand frequently. You know, Bob Charles, Cal Nagel, Peter Thompson. You know, they were the big three players from Australasia, all major champions, and Peter five-time major champion, and mm-hmm. he won the New Zealand Open like nine times. Um, you know, one of the greatest ever players out of Australia. Well, I mean, you arguably he's got five majors. You could say he is mm. the greatest mm. um, player out of Australia. So I got the chance to carry him. And this, you know, and it, it's, this is a dead true story. And um, he played the New Zealand Open and he finished third in the tournament. And he was quite astounded at my ability for someone that never had carried in a tournament before to judge distances and so forth. At the completion of the tournament, he gave me $150, which was like, you know, I was working... What year was this? Like late 70s? Early 76. Early. Okay, shit. And that was like handing someone a million dollars today. <laughs> I, I was just, I couldn't believe it. And, and, and on top of that, he gave me like 50 golf balls, all the golf balls that he'd used during the week and his practice balls. And, and, and they were balls that, you know, you couldn't get as a kid here. They were very expensive or, or, or you couldn't get them. So right there and then, I said, I want to be a golf caddy. That, 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 that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to be a golf caddy. Life. I knew nothing about how you make a living as a golf caddy, but I said, this, this is what I want to do. And, and that's, how, that's how the ball got rolling. Amazing. Um, have, do you know the, um, the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour theory? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I absolutely I am. My, yeah. my, my son is very familiar with that. He's told me all about that as mm. far as um, cause what, what he does. But yeah, no, I am familiar with that. Yeah, because you started so young, I suppose you, you, you got your 10,000 hours under your belt at a very <laughs> young age. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> look, I just loved caddying, had a knack for it, and um, yeah, did it my whole life. Yeah, so um, what, what else were you, were you into as a kid? Where, where did the motorsport thing come from? There's not a huge motorsport community in Paraparo, is there? <laughs> no, we used to go... Um, I, my brother and my father and I used to go every Saturday night over to Timaru, uh and, and, and watch the speedway in Timaru. We just, it's just something we went and did. Uh, my father loved the, the solo riders, and, and back then, you know, we, we had the likes of Barry Briggs, Ronnie Moore, and Ivan Major, all world champions in their own right, and that. And they used to ride quite frequently over the summer at Timaru Speedway against a lot of overseas riders, and we used to love that. And, um, you know, I just used to love going to Speedway, and... I kept going to Speedway the rest of, you know, or, or whenever I, when I started my journey as a caddy and i come back to New Zealand over the summer, I'd always go to the Speedway and, uh, you know, just decide to take it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that about you, that just the, the juxtaposition between the world's best caddy and then he's coming home and racing these midget cars or whatever and, you know, wandering around these um, illustrious golf course, courses with the, the Valvoline logo on you. What is Valvoline? Like an oil or something? Yeah, yeah. No, I've been very fortunate to have a long time car sponsor in Valvoline, and then I became like a brand ambassador with Valvoline in, in the states when I was caddying for Tiger. Yeah, so yeah. I've had a long relationship with Valvoline. But it's, I mean, it's a logo that you'd associate associate, I guess, more with like NASCAR or something than uh, Pebble Beach. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I always had a lot of jokes about that. Yeah. So, um, and then so Peter Thompson, and then was it Greg Norman after Peter Thompson? Yeah. Well, I ca- you know, I ca- caddied for Peter. I was only at school when I was caddying for yeah. Peter, so I, I'd caddy from we can. I, and when he came over to New Zealand, and then I did actually go to Australia and carry from uh, and won one or two tournaments. Uh, then I started caddying. So the, as soon as I turned was old enough to leave school at fifteen, I uh, went over to the European tour, and um, I don't remember a lot of my early days. But the one thing I can remember it so clearly now is uh, having only ever stepped out of Wellington or Auckland Airport to get out of London Heathrow Airport at 15 years of age. It's like, <laughs> it was just mind-blowing. Um, you know, there's more people at the airport than what there is in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that moment, <laughs> thinking, Jesus, this is pretty intimidating. Yeah. You know, I, I managed to get on, on a train uh, to where I was heading to, into London, up on a train. I believe the first tournament was in Leeds, and I carried it. It was a tournament called the Car Care International. Uh, I didn't have a job jacked up. I, I went there, like, without a job, and um, I got on to an English player. Um, his name was Michael King, and um, 
yeah, I caved for him for a couple of tournaments. And, you know, just at the start, there wasn't a lot of professional caddies uh, that would go to every tournament. Um, so it was easy getting work. And, um, yeah, I started off and I caddied for Ian Baker Finch for a little bit. And then um, one summer in Australia, Ian was paired with Greg Norman at the Australian Open. And um, following the tournament, Greg rang me up um, back in New Zealand and said, hey, I like what, what I saw when you were caddying for Ian. Would you come and caddy for me at the start of the year in Australia and he played and they had a handful of tournaments at the start of the year in Australia the Australian Masters the Victorian Open um, and yeah one thing led to another and I ended up going to caddy for Greg Norman and then yeah then that's just that's just how it got rolling yeah yeah Greg Greg Norman um, phenomenal golfer phenomenal even more phenomenal businessman perhaps the great white shark massive massive brand um, yeah what was what was that like what are your recollections of that time yeah, I was. Uh, he he was the most demanding player I've ever carried for, and probably was he? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, and probably one of the most demanding players ever on on any caddies because all the not all not that he had a lot of caddies, but the guys that did carry for him, um, he he was very demanding. Um, that's just his nature. I mean, he was a completely different guy off the golf course to what he was on the golf course, um, but. Um, Caddying for him was absolutely fantastic and the fact that he knew that I was a young bloke and he took me under my wing and actually taught me a lot about the game uh, as far as you know the shots that a pro is trying to play and so forth. So I, I had a very good understanding of what's required, which he taught me. And in, in, in today's world, I don't think a player would take a guy under their wing and, and actually mm. explain to them. You know, You're what not at that level, eh? No, not at that level. So I had a great understanding, and, and amazingly, that understanding, you know, I was able to take that understanding on for the other players that I'd care for, and even, you know, Tiger in particular, and say, you know, this is what Greg used to say to me, and this is what Greg would say here, and so forth. So it was, yeah, it was good. But Greg was great to care for, very demanding. Mm. Um, but uh, on the same token, we, we, you know, we stayed friends for a long time. Yeah, well, you mentioned earlier that he, he texts you after the Adam Scott one, so you're still in touch. Yeah, yeah. You know, obviously he's running the Live Tour now, and I've not mentioned it one time since we've spoken because, you know, I know he's obviously, <laughs> he's probably been, well, not probably, he's been bombarded over the, his time. Running. Oh, yeah, what's the, what's the Live Tour for anyone that doesn't? Uh, that's the is it Saudi Arabia tournament? And, yeah. And the golfers that have defected and gone there got paid, like, ex Excruciatingly large sums of money. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, is that, is that in, a, in a nutshell? In a nutshell, yeah. It, it, it's a different concept. They've been paid extraordinary amounts of money, uh, and there's been a lot of controversy over it because those players that have defected to the Live Tour don't get any world ranking points. So their, their world ranking every, every week, their world ranking slides down. Um, it, it's a different. It's 54 whole tournaments. Um, so there's no cut. There's, a, there's only 48 players. They have a team element, but. Um, yeah, it, it, it's caused a lot of conflict in the game, but um, but probably for you know, I think in the long run it's going to be uh, going to be great for the game. It's yeah. provided a different playing field and uh, a different atmosphere for tournaments and gives fans a different option. Yeah, were, were, were you with Greg Norman that year that he um, famously choked at the Masters? No, no. I was what, what year was that? Was that late ninety seven? No, no. Uh, yeah, oh, ninety four. Yeah, I was caddying for Ray Floyd at the time. Right. Um, but so that was as a, as a mate of his and a former employee, that must have been excruciating to watch. Well, it was interesting because, yeah, um, I was staying in the house. Uh, Fanny Sooneson, long time caddy for Nick Feldo, and I were f friends, and we were staying, we'd shared the same house at Augusta for 20 something years, and she was caddying for Greg, uh, sorry, for Nick, and you know, Greg had that big lead on the Sunday, and, and when we left the house, I said, "Good luck, but you're not going to be able to get there today." She says, "Nick will win this mm. <laughs> from something like seven shots behind." Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that was, um, yeah, that was, that heart was heartbreaking. Yeah, and uh, at the end of the tournament, I actually flew back to Florida with Greg that night, um, and we sat on the beach. Um, he tried to. He, he wanted me to come back to caddy for him, and we sat on the beach. And yeah, uh, it was it was pretty hard to see a grown man cry. Um, mm. Yeah, he 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 was broken after that tournament. Yeah, I mean seven shot lead. Um, instead of you know the big mistake he made it was like when Tiger had a seven shot lead, he'd try and make it an eight shot lead. Then make it <laughs> make it. You know, Greg Greg played so defensive that day, and uh, you know. 
Greg's great motto when he signs an autograph, Greg Norman, attack life. That was his thing, attack life. And he didn't attack the golf course that day. And I mean, if he had played in his normal way, he would have no way he would have mm. gotten beaten. But he played very conservative. And sometimes when you play conservative, it doesn't happen. Mm. Um, yeah. And what was the mood like on the on the private jet? Um, <laughs> there was no conversation. <laughs> <laughs> there was none. But uh, we got back to his house. Um, Grabbed an esky full of beers, went down to the beach, and yeah, we, 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 we he went over the whole thing, but it, it was heartbreaking, mm. uh, heart, heart wrenching. Yeah, see. I wonder how long it took him to. Cause I've had um, other people on the uh, the podcast, like Shane Cameron, and Shane talked about the fight with David Tour where he got smoked, and he said it took him, he reckons, about seven years before he realised, oh, I haven't thought about this all day today. So for something like that with Greg, you wonder how long it was before he uh, sort of managed to put it behind him. Yeah, I mean, I. That's a very good question. I mean, I, I don't think he'd ever put that behind him. Mm. I mean, it's, uh, he wanted to win that tournament. You know, he won the British Open a couple of times. Came well, he he was runner up in all majors, and um, he it, like all Australians, he wanted to win that tournament more than any of them. So uh, he he would still think about that today. There's no question yeah. that he wouldn't. Yeah. Do you think the result could have been different if you were on his bag that day? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I am the goat. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, well, well, in terms of like you mentioned before the role of a caddy, and you talked about the psychologist um, aspect of it. So I yeah, think with, with I those mean, sort of skills and experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard one to yeah. quantify, but um, you know, his, you know, as soon as that tournament finished, he was on the phone to me. I mean, he obviously had would have had a thousand things going through his head, and then he on the, had the phone to me. Steve, get on my plane. I'm, I'm, we're going back to West Palm Beach. I need to chat to you. And of course, I knew what it was going to be about. Um, but I would have loved to have gone back to work for him. Um, but I always, you know, loyalty is a big thing in that. Mm. So I I um, was scouting for Ray Floyd at the time. Things were going good, and I was joy. And you know, he he was good to me, and I didn't want to say to him, you know, I'm going back to Caddy for Greg. That's, so yeah, that's um. It's an interesting point, hey. Like it, it does demonstrate, I think, um, a huge growth mindset. Like the fact that yeah, you know, the day he had the worst tournament potentially, worst closing round of his life, um, instead of just licking his wounds, he's thinking about okay, how can I get better next time by trying to recruit you? It's um, it's a fascinating insight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, yeah, he he obviously thought you know he was going to okay, I've let that slip. I'm going to give an. I'll have another opportunity at that. Yeah. I want to do that, you know, because he loved the course. He had he played f well frequently there. Um, you know, he had two runner-up finishes in the years that I was carrying for him. Um, but yeah, so but it didn't eventuate mm. that I didn't go back. Mm. But um, yeah, it's, it's a it was a <laughs> it was a heartbreaking one to watch. <laughs> I saw a photo of him online the the other day. He's in his seventies. He's still ripped, eh? Ripped as fuck. <laughs> yeah, he 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 uh, he's worked out his whole life. Um, he, he, you know, he's he's pounded the gym and he's fit as can be. And um, yeah, look, he, he's a great character. Yeah. So who who's Ray Floyd? I don't know much about Ray Floyd. So yes. it was um, Greg, then Ray, and yep. then Tiger. So I went on to Ray Floyd, a, 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 an American player. Um, yeah, he's a four-time major winner, just a, a, one of the top American players in that. And I went to K for him. Um, from 1989 to 1999, um, had a good run with him. He had a couple of close calls at Augusta, um, and it was during that time, you know, I caddied for 40 plus years. I only ever had one regret as a caddy, which is, you know, quite remarkable that mm. you only have one regret. But Ray had the opportunity in 1992 to be the oldest player to win at Augusta um, at 50 years of age. He'd already won. Um, at Durrell previously, just a month or so before, uh, to become the second oldest player to win behind Sam Snead on the PGA Tour. And he had a chance to get at Augusta uh, with Nick Faldo. And we got to the 17th hole. He needed to finish 4-4 to win the tournament. And the green there is different to what it is now, but basically it was a two-tiered green with a, one, the right side was lower than the than the left side of the green and the pin was on the front right hand side of the green and he said to me on a second shot he had a nine iron in his hand and he said I'm just going to hit it at the slope and, and fade it off the slope and the first thing that came into my head is what if you hit it at the slope and you don't fade it and maybe you pull it a little bit and if you hit, and then that, where that particular hole location was if you left your ball up on the top side of the hole of the green you couldn't two part too quick you put it off the green and I, the first thing that came to my head is, no, you want to hit it straight at the flag so that if you pull it, you're okay. And if you push it, you're off the green. He's the best chipper in the world. End of story. I didn't say that. It's the only time that I can recall mm. something that came to my head. 
and I didn't say it. And what did he do? He hit it on the left side, pulled it, three putted, lost you know lost in a playoff to Faldo. So, uh, and we 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 joke all the time every year when I, subsequently when we went back to Augusta all the years counting for Tiger. Then Adam, I see Raymond all the time at Augusta. And he says, if you had a spoken up, I would have had another green jacket. And I said, oh, look, well, you don't, you, those green jackets are ugly, Ray. You don't, you don't want, you, you've got one, that's enough. It's not your colour anyway. <laughs> yeah, we, so we, we joked for years about that. Yeah, I think that goes to show the, the importance of um, like failure and mistakes, eh? Because it's like you would have learned a valuable lesson of that, out, out of that incident, out of not speaking them out. Uh, speaking yeah, them out. well, it's out, like, you know, my reputation as a caddy is that I always speak up and I'm, I'm renowned for that. Mm. And um, it's the only time that I never did, you know, when something comes into your head, there's a reason why it comes into your head. It's not, it's just a spur of the moment thought. You know, when the player was explaining what he's going to do, you know, you're thinking about it, and you've already thought about what sort of shot he should hit. And that, and um, yeah, so, yeah. Mm. But. And, and um, you were, so you were caddying for Ray Floyd when you first met Tiger. I, I, I heard a story, I don't know if it's true, you, you sort of fanboyed a bit and you got an autograph? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but so um, when um, Tiger was an amateur, uh, he played a couple of times with Ray at Augusta in the Masters. Uh, a lot of young guys would come to Augusta and play when they hadn't played there before and they'd play a practice. They'd, they'd always ask someone like Jack Nicholas or Raymond Floyd or someone that's played the course a lot and had a lot of success there. Raymond was a great guy at nurturing young players and talking mm-hmm. to them. Augusta, there's a lot of local knowledge there. You can't find that local knowledge in one week. Uh, so Tiger played with him a couple of times. That's where I got to meet him. Um, and then, so, yeah, then that's how it came to be. Like, in 1999, um, I was actually, I, I was back in New Zealand and Tiger let his caddy go. I didn't know anything about it because I don't really follow golf too much when I'm at home. And then uh, the first tournament... Uh, that I was catting was the following week that after Tiger had fired his caddy, so I got to Durrell um, in, in Miami, and uh, I get back to my hotel on the Tuesday night, and the phone rings. It was pretty late, and um, a guy on, on the end of the phone says it's Tiger Woods here, and uh, I've got a friend of mine that can impersonate Tiger to a T, <laughs> and I thought it was him, and I said, Bob, it's late. I've just come in from New Zealand. Give me give me a ring tomorrow. I'll, I'll just da 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 da. Five minutes later, the phone rings again. Same thing. Tiger Woods here. And I said, Bob, for fuck's sake, it's late. You know, <laughs> j- just give me a ring tomorrow, mate. I'm tired. Da, da, da. Third time, and I thought, oh, maybe it's... And, and it was Tiger. <laughs> so, he, he we, we, you know, we laughed about that that many times. That, you know, it was him. Uh, he was asking, um, you know, if I'd be interested in caring for him. So that I was in Miami at the time. He lived in Orlando. He wasn't playing in the tournament in Miami, and, and he lived in Orlando four hours up the road and that so at the completion of that tournament on the Sunday I drove up to Orlando and yeah sat down with Tiger and discussed what what what, uh, what was going to happen yeah yeah why you like you you were, you were very different to his, his previous caddy was that old guy um Fluff yeah Mike, Mike Cowan correct yeah, yeah with big big walrus moustache <laughs> and um yeah you're very different to you like you're athletic and yeah I mean t- Tiger talked to several people including Ray that I caddy for Butch Harmon um so he, he, he spoke to like four people about who he should hire as a caddy. And every, all four people that he spoke to, my name was synonymous with the four people. So he said, you know, and, and, and you know, he, 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 we'd spoken several times and then we'd had a good laugh during the practice round. So we played together and he, 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 he said that he saw how serious I was in those practice rounds when I was caddying, when he was playing as an amateur in the Masters and practice rounds playing with Raymond, he could see how serious I was about it. So that's how it came to be. Yeah. Mm. And you you didn't have to hesitate to say yes? It was an astounding fuck yes. <laughs> oh, no, actually, oddly enough, it wasn't. Because really? it was 1999, and I, I, you know, I'd actually said to myself um, that at the end of that year, or at the end of 2000, that I, that was going to be enough of catting. I was going to go and do something else. It's, you know, it's a gypsy lifestyle. You're travelling around the world non-stop and you know i thought maybe i'd go and do something else but um you know i i didn't say yes straight away but then of course when i when i sat down and spoke to him and and he went through what his goals were and what his aspirations were and so forth you know i thought you know this is going to be a pretty good ride mm. and if, you know obviously he was good but um you know he, he he was new to the tour and and you know he came on in a big hurry when he won the masters but he sort of petered off there for a little bit so uh and, and 
we always laugh now too because the very first week I, I came from, he, he played pretty average and he hit one of the worst shots I've ever seen. And and I uh, and to this day we I tell him how overrated he was. Like we we <laughs> joked about it. You know, I mean, you're Tiger, you're you're way overrated. The first week he I think he finished forty fifth something like that in the tournament. He played terrible. So uh, yeah, we have some good laughs. Oh, about that's that. good. Keep him grounded. Yeah, Keep yeah. Him grounded. Um, and yeah, no, so it was a it was an awesome um, professional partnership, but also like a, a friendship as well. Like um, he was best man at your wedding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you what, what was his speech like? Yeah, no. He, speech uh, from Tiger Woods. Does 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 he write it himself, or does he hire a speech? <laughs> oh writer? no, no, he, he's down to earth like that. Uh, no, it was good. You know, Kirsty and I, my wife, we went to Tiger and Elon's wedding, and Tiger and his wife, and and, and they came out to New Zealand here and um, came to our wedding. And Tiger had already been here, played in the New Zealand Open. Um, so he, you know, he, he loved the country. He, he he loved the how laid back New Zealand is, and. He loved the fact that he could, you know, get out and, and go for a run somewhere and not too many people would recognise him and so forth. So, yeah, we became very close, obviously. You, what, uh, what do you mean they wouldn't recognise him? Yeah, no, I mean, not... You'd, not, re you'd recognise him a mile away, Oh, well, not, yeah. You, 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 why you, <laughs> you put a windbreaker on and put a, be a beanie on and some glasses. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, some yeah. people recognise him. But, um, yeah, no, we, 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 we became great mates. Mm. And um, I was very fortunate that I knew where that line was drawn because that's what happened with Greg Norman and myself. We became such great mates that, you know, went over the line of between a caddy and a player. And so I, I was well aware where that line, where to draw that line with Tiger was. So even though we became very good mates in that, I knew where the line was drawn. It was good. We stayed great mates until, you know, until it all ended. And, yeah. um, you know, we had a great working relationship and a great relationship off the course as yeah. well. What was um, his his wedding like? What are your recollections of that? Like, who was who was there? Like Jordan, Oprah? Oh, like I mean, I, oh, like I can't. He, he, Tiger was, you know, he had a great mate, a lot of great mates, and you know, obviously Michael Jordan's one of his great mates. Charles Barkley's one of his great mates. Um, you know, there's a number of um, other athletes there and, and so forth. But you, know I mean? you, you seem very nonchalant about all this. Like, are you? But uh, when you're there, you must be like, "Fuck, this is amazing." Yeah, no? well, I mean, no, no, not necessarily because you're like, you're, like you're so unbothered, aren't you? Well, you when when these like you know Tiger, he played a lot of rounds of golf with Michael Jordan mm. and Charles Barkley, you know, away from the tour and that. So you you know they they were just like you know other guys that you knew and um, there was no one there that you hadn't met before, sort of thing. So you know, like and when when you, I've been fortunate, you know, even before caddying for Tiger, having caddied for Greg and Ray. In the pro ams and a lot of that, that a lot of these people play in the pro ams. You get to you know see and play with a lot of these guys. Greg Norman was great. One of his best mates was Nigel Mansell, the Formula mm. One racer, and that. So you know, he, he, when you look at all these guys and that, because you're around them all the time, you don't look at you know Tiger Woods is just another player, he's just another bloke. You know, you don't Michael Jordan, he's just another bloke. You know, you look you don't look at them because you be, you know you don't. You just want to act normal around them, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So you, so you never got a, a selfie with any of these people. You no, must have. No, really? No. You're not a selfie guy. No, or? not a selfie. You regret that now? No. <laughs> no, but you can't. You, you know, you can't. God, I would have zero chill in that situation. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't have any selfies with any of these guys. But it's the memories, you, you, you know, and the, and and the. It was very good to meet a lot of these people because you. I, I always was very forthcoming and, and, and asking them questions, you know, trying to, like, Tiger was also good mates with Roger Federer and, and uh, I, you know, sat down with him one time and we, and th when we were having dinner and that and, and sort of tried to see how he handled pressure and what drove him and sort of thing. And, you know, oh, so you're trying to pick their brains and tap oh, into Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, um, when Greg sort of played, Greg Norman, when he was playing on the tour, he, you know, he idolised Jack Nicholas and, and Jack took him under his wing a little bit. That's how Greg got to be based in West Palm Beach because that's where Jack Nicholas was. And Greg, Jack took Greg under his wing and we played a lot of practice rounds with Jack Nicholas. And he, he was, he thought it was great because I quizzed him a lot. You know, always trying to get information. And that's how, you, you know, the more information you have, the better you can get. So mm. it was fortunate to be catting for these guys that are, successful golfers because they mingled with other sportsmen it was great to ask other mm. sportsmen from different sports how they handle pressure what they did repair and and so forth yeah so that was you know that's one of the benefits i guess of caddying for some of the better players that um you know they get to be paired with in pro-ams or they you know the, the 
these other great sporting mm. legends are around you and you can tap into their mind. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing you and me are very different I probably wouldn't have lasted 10 years in that job <laughs> <laughs> fired for acting inappropriate in front of some of the cool friends yeah I think uh, I think a lot of people get you know you, they get intimidated by big people like that and they wouldn't ask some of the questions that I asked and I, Jack Nicholas I think uh, well in fact he told me he respected that I had had the willingness to ask him some very difficult questions when he had no qualms in sharing that information because nobody else would ask him. What, what like, can you remember some of the questions? Oh, just about yeah. course preparation, how you handle pressure, what sort of shots do you, what's, what is the worst kind of shots hit under pressure, what are yeah. the best kind of shots you hit under pressure. And the one thing that he, he, he stuck to is that, you know, he said, Steve, when you go out the golf course and you figure out how you're going to play the golf course, unless the weather conditions or something are dramatically different, never change your game plan. Never, ever change your game plan. Um, and, like, that was a good bit of advice mm -hmm. there because, I mean, like, when we go back to talking about Greg Norman, what did he do on that Sunday? He changed mm -hmm. his game plan. Yeah. And Jack never changed his game plan unless the weather conditions dictated that you had to. Um, yeah, and, just and, and his, his record still stands eh, for the most majors and unlikely to be broken. Yeah, no, that uh, look, what's that, Tiger on and what's uh, the Golden Bear? Yeah, yeah, so Tiger's on 15 and Jack's on 18, but yeah. it's um, no, that that's never going to be a clip now. I mean, there's just too many good players now, and unfortunately, Tiger's health is not going to allow mm. him to play enough golf where he can compete and, and win major championships. I mean, it's just a shame, but um, that record's going to stand forever, yeah. So while I'm being um, a bit of a sycophantic about this, um, <laughs> this this lifestyle that you've been privy to that no one else in New Zealand does, um, you, you stayed at Tiger's house. What does 39 million buy you in Miami? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, look. <laughs> You're not sharing a bathroom, are you? No, <laughs> I mean, look, the, 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 Tiger lived, when I first gave him, he, he lived in a gated community um, like a lot of the athletes do and um, Shaq used to live in the same gated community as Tiger, and you know it was it, it was always entertaining because obviously his the cars the vehicles that he had obviously had to be extended because of the site you know he's <laughs> and, that, and, and, and he he loved his boom boxes. So <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, Tiger, yeah, you know, look, these guys they make exponential kind of money and they have properties that are you know like you can't even you know you can't even fathom what they're like, mm. I guess, but. Um, yeah, that's just what that's what yeah. it is. So there's one um, particularly mem memorable tournament, the um, the 2000 US Open. You remember that Pebble Beach? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I remember that with a lot of detail. Man, yeah, Tiger won by um, 15 shots, which is just unheard of, right? So um, what is what is that? What does that night look like? So you you win by that sort of amount? Um, is it a, a massive celebration? Uh, yeah, well, I'll just step back there a little bit you know that was arguably up until that point Tiger's greatest performance he mm. was 12 under and the next guy was 3 over 15 shot win but the funniest thing about that week is it nearly didn't happen so Tiger's practice was just the best we'd ever seen myself and Butch Harmon as coach uh, we stood back and, and it was it was unbelievable I'd never seen a guy hit a ball in practice on the range and on the course. So we had to hold them back as much as we could because you don't want to do too much practice because so sometimes you can over-practice and then and it goes the other way. But anyway, so the, the, the famous story about the week was is that I nearly ran out of golf balls. <laughs> that seems like a bad era for a caddy. So what actually happened is on the Friday we had a uh, fog delay. They had that marine layer came in off the bay there and we stopped play on the 13th hole on Friday afternoon. And so we had to complete our round the very next morning, on Saturday morning, early. And at that time, the way Pebble Beach was set up, they had the driving range in one area, which was on the polo fields, the putting greens at the clubhouse, and then we had to restart right out on the uh, 14th hole, 13th hole, which is, is almost the farthest part of, away from the clubhouse. So given the start time that, that the players had to be in position by, it wasn't possible to go all the way up to the range, back to the putting green, and out to the course. So Tiger did no putting before he teed off. He just went to the range, hit some balls, and then got in the, uh, the courtesy car out to the where he had to be. 
So I'd put the clubs down in his room on Friday night and just w- walked into his room on Saturday morning and didn't d- usually we, at, at the start of every day check everything. You know, we've got enough gloves, enough balls. Do we need any wet weather gear? What do we need? Extra towels, whatever it might be, food, whatever it could be. So, but I didn't do anything. I just picked the bag up because it was just a continuation of yesterday's round. I don't need anything else. We had everything in the bag yesterday, so that's all good. We get out to the to the fourteenth hole for our restart. And uh, I put my hand in the bag, and there's only three golf balls. I thought, that's a bit strange. There should be more than three, but that's no big deal. Playing unbelievable golf, I'm not going to lose any <laughs> golf balls. But the very first hole that he played, he hit his tee shot into the rough, and then he hit it out with a short iron to the green and scuffed the ball, you know, put some groove marks on the golf ball. And when he walked off the green, he threw it off to, to a young man, a young kid walking with his father, and, of course, this kid's just so excited. He's showing his dad, look, I've got one of Tiger's balls. It's got his name on it, this, that, and the other. I'm thinking, I need to go over and ask that kid. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case we might need it. But, no, no, we won't need it. You know, and, and I couldn't do that because imagine what Tiger would be thinking or someone was thinking. You, when you're around Tiger Woods, you can't do something without someone seeing what you do. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Not a good look. Not a good look. So he plays 15, 14, 15, 16, 17. We get the 18th tee. We've got two balls. No problem. I can't, you know, I'm thinking probably should hit an iron off the tee here because he's out of bounds to the right and, of course, you've got the ocean to the left in that. But I can't say anything. He's playing unbelievable golf. I'm not going to step in and say you should be playing conservative on the last hole for why, for what reason. So, I, you know, I'm not going to say a word. He just says, drive. I said, yep, drive it. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't warn him that there's only one ball? No, 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 <laughs> because he'd be saying, you get your sorry ass back from New Zealand if that's the case. <laughs> anyway, he hits his tee shot. Worst shot he's hit of the week. Snipe hooks it into the water. Now we've got one ball left. And I'm holding my hand. He puts the driver back in the bag, slams it back in the bag. The other two guys he's playing with have got to hit next. And I've got my head cover, my hand s- grasping the head cover on top of the wood as hard as I can. And he's going, take that, give me that fucking driver. And I said, look, Tiger, you're leading the US Open by nine. Just hit an iron down there. You know, let's get the, you know, and come back. You got, give me that fucking driver. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if he hits this one either out of bounds or, Hits it in the ocean. We're out of golf balls. Could, could you not one of the other players? Could you? Is that not done? You couldn't. If they that. were playing the exact same golf ball, you can only play. You know, you have to start not with the same ball, but the exact same a he, brand or yeah. He's okay. playing a Nike ball, and the other guys are playing a Titleist ball. Okay. So um, yeah, obviously you could do that if they were playing the exact ball. I mean, you wouldn't want the player to see you do that, or either of the players. But yes, you mm. could do that. Mm. Um, so anyway, so he hits and hits that drive with his last ball. He hits in the fairway, but on the 18th hole, Pebble Beach, there's a pine tree in the middle of the fairway. And as we're walking down there, uh, I'm thinking, you know what, this is going to be right behind that pine tree. And when he get down there, sure enough, it's pretty close to it. So what's he going to do now? He's going to hit a big shot with a big fade, a big left to right shot that goes out over the bay and back. <laughs> it's like, okay, I mean, I, and I know he's going to try the shot. I can't say anything either. And it's the first time in my life that I'm standing there and, and my ass is puckering. I, I, it's just, I, I, I've heard people say that and express that, and I thought, I've never known that. I mean, I've heard, you know, sometimes your hands shake and your neck shakes. Well, my ass was puckering. Anyway, so he starts this ball out over the ocean and brings it back down just short of the green. Gets it up and down, you know, anyway, it goes on to win the tournament by 15 shots. An incredible performance. But this is to give you some insight. You you, you mentioned to me, you know, what was the celebration, this, that and the other. I'll just give you an insight to how this guy thinks and how he's different to anyone else that's ever played the game and probably in sports. So after the final hole there you go in there and and you go in there and while the player checks a scorecard, they have a scorer and then... the scorer will read out the score and Tiger will check it against his scorecard and I'll, and I'll also have my own scorecard and just to check, that's what you do. And, um, okay, he does the scorecard and he walks outside and I'm standing there once, he's, you know, he's in a minute there shaking hands with different people and he walks outside the scorer's tent and I'm the first person that's standing there with the golf clubs and he says, so tell me what that is, what was all the drama about on the 18th hole on Friday? You know, and I tell him the story, and, and he just he absolutely laughs. And he said, "Well, if we, you know, he, he he said, if we had a run out of golf balls, you would have been working at TW's car wash because he, <laughs> he he always told me that one day he was going to open the car wash, and if you don't if you don't live up to my expectations, Steve, you'll be running the car wash, not carrying the clubs." And then the next thing he said to me, he said, um, 
I'm going to play even better at the British Open in St Andrews. I want you to get your ass over there as quick as you can. I want you to know every blade of grass on that course. That's exactly what he said to me. So instead of sort of going away and having some kind of celebration, it was like, oh my, okay, you know, I, I was, I just had to get my head round. Okay, I was going back to New Zealand supposedly for a few weeks. I thought, you know, I, I've got to get over to St Andrews a week earlier than I probably was going because you know he told me he's, he's going to play better, um, mm. and he did amazingly. Wow. So the the next major that was the the Open Championship. He played better than he did at Pebble. That was the pinnacle of the 13 years of caring for Tiger. That's the tournament he played the best at was St. Andrews. It was just remarkable. And that was a nine-shot victory. So he'd gone 15-shot victory, nine-shot victory, and two major championships. So is, is, it, is it an exaggeration or is that accurate? So you won the, the 2000 US Open by 15 shots, and then that night you're going over to inspect the, the British Open course. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I was going back to New Zealand. Yeah. But... I was scheduled to, like, to go back to the British Open, you know, maybe, I can't remember, you know, three or four days before, but yeah. because of his high expectations, and you know, I want you to know every blade of grass, you know, I want, you, I want to know everything. Not that, and not that you wouldn't normally, you'd always do that anyway, but just the extra pressure of him telling me I'm going to play even better, and da, 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 and it's St Andrews, and St Andrews is a difficult golf course to navigate as far as, you know, there's so many bunkers, you've got to have a real knack, because there's, you play split different fairways depending on the winds. They've got double greens. You've got to have a lot of no knowledge here. Like mm. a caddy that's never been there before is unlikely to win the tournament with their mm. player the first time they play there because there's no golf course that requires more information than that golf course because there's a lot of blind shots that you can't see where you've got to try and hit it and you've got to know where all these bunkers are in your head where you, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to explain. But, um, and, and that, that, that's the way it was. But, What's sort of different about Tiger? I mean, he's different in a lot of ways, but uh, he, he never celebrated. You know, he was always on to the next thing. You know, he, he felt like he was supposed to win. He wanted to win. A job wasn't well done until he, you know, won. So if you didn't win a tournament, it was considered a failure. Mm. So working for him was tremendously stressful, and there was never any celebrating. That's the weirdest thing. People always think you must have these massive parties, this, that, the other. It was never. It was always, what's the next goal? Yeah, I mean, he, he would even... That's why he's so good, though, right? Yeah, I mean, he's just remarkable. Yeah, he, he, he would, I'll never forget one time at Bay Hill, he lived in Orlando, and at Bay Hill, uh, he won the tournament, but he on the last hole, he held a remarkable putt to hold, to win the tournament, but it was a very lengthy putt, like a 40-footer, and he hit a poor iron shot to hit it at 40 feet, and as soon as he left the golf course, after he'd done the trophy presentation, that we went back to where he lived, onto the range, and he hit like 200 of that same shot he was trying to hit there. I mean, he was relentless, and he, he seldom, in my eyes, he seldom celebrated. He, he might have had a cigar once an hour again, but, um, you know, he certainly didn't go on a bender like some of the guys do when they, when they win tournaments. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had Ryan, your mate Ryan Fox on the podcast. It seems like when he plays well, it's a lot more fun afterwards for him and the caddy. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> look, these, got, these guys are notorious. They go on a two or three day bender. After, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you win a, ma a major championship, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's something as, as a golfer, a professional golfer, that's what everyone aspires to do. And, and when you actually accomplish that, it's an incredible feeling that. But, I mean, he, he, he was mm. he's, he, he's different in so many aspects, and particularly that one. But, I mean, he, he was straight on to the next thing. You're like, how, what's the next tournament? What sort of shots am I required to play? And da 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 da, -da. How, did, how did you handle um, that pressure? Like, where, did, where does this resilience come from and this mental, mental fortitude? Yeah, well, one of the things I did do was, you know, I always got away... Uh, in all my weeks off, I always came back to New Zealand. Um, Just to de-stress for a bit, hang out with your people? Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my wife was a great leveller for me, and she kept me well grounded and, and, you know, like, reminded me how important it was to stay level. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, look, he, he, he was so desperate to break... Jack's record of 18 majors and, and that was what kept you know that's all I thought about I thought that when, the, when, when that moment came I had no doubt it was never going to come I thought that's going to be one of the greatest if not the greatest sporting achievements ever because it's something that no one will ever do mm -hmm. and nobody thought someone would come along and do it and here's a guy that had every opportunity to do it and I, I, I just I pictured that over and over my head and that's what kept me going um, but you know, coming back to New Zealand and being able to just chill out with my friends and family 
and have that opportunity to get away from, you know, America is a lot of hype and a lot of that, and particularly being around Tiger, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's not something that you could do, you know, 24-7 for 52 weeks a year, be around someone that's, you know, I mean, look, I, I, it's remarkable how these guys handle it themselves. Yeah. Um, you've got to be a different makeup, but, I mean, you know, obviously he, he was playing golf at a level that no one ever, ever played for for a sustained period of time, and, um, yeah. Yeah, and you had a front row seat. Yeah, there was, yeah there's another... Another tournament, I, I don't know which one it is, you probably know, um, but Tiger hold out and won, and then um, you guys hugged each other, and it was like a it was like a lingering, I think it was just after his dad's death? Yeah. It so was a lingering hug, like he didn't want to let go of you. Yeah, yeah, so no one had ever seen that side of Tiger, that was the Hoy Lake um, at Royal Liverpool when they had the Open Championship uh, in 2006. I love uh, your memory of this stuff, by the way. Um, yeah, so it'd some, be easy. I mean, when you're playing week in week out, it'd be easy for them to blur into. Well, both. yeah, some some weeks are more memorable than the others, but you know, major championships are pretty special. But yeah, that one's memorable because it was, um, you know, Tiger's first major championship success following the passing of his father. He played in the U.S. Open prior to that, um, having not practiced for several weeks before after his father passed away, and he. He played pretty poorly, and then um, he came to Royal Liverpool, um, and it was it was a fascinating week. Um, so he, he hadn't, or no one had played it. It was the first time they'd played there a professional tournament since uh, in the modern era for the British Open, anyway. And we got there, and the previous tournament that Tiger played in uh, was the Western Open in Chicago, and he didn't fare that well, but he was hitting his long irons amazing that week. Um, that was what stood out from that week to me. And we went to the Hoy Lake, and it was hard baked out. The golf course was hard and fast. I'd had a great summer there. Well, they were enjoying a great summer, and it was a really linksy course. The ball was running a mile, and the, and I went round. We got we flew there. I flew with Tiger, and straight to the house. And he says, "Steve, you get out and have a look at the golf course, and come back, and we'll talk about it at lunch before I go out there." And um, so I went out there and I walked around the golf course for a few hours and that and thought, you know, he can get around here without playing a driver. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's his, the strength right now is his long lines. He can lay back from a lot of these bunkers. Uh, instead of going into the green with sort of seven, eight, nine irons, he can lay back, take the pen, take the trouble out of play and hit a lot of four, five and six irons into the greens. Um, and that's exactly what he did. He, he hit one driver in the tournament. That was it. In the whole 72 holes, he, he eliminated all the bunkers and um, yeah, so he and then when he came down the 18th hole, um, it was a grey overcast sort of day. And, and as he approached the green there from about 100 metres, the sun shone through. It, you know, it, it was kind of airy. Mm. Um, and that was like I said to him, "That's you know, that's your father looking down on you." And that's what it, uh, that's what I thought it was just so airy that the sun would just shine through for that little moment while he was walking to the green. From from the time he approached the grandstand where the grandstand starts till he got to the green the sun shone through and I said that to him you know that's just what came into my head I said that to him and yeah after he putted out he, he just broke down and I no one had ever seen that side of Tiger in anything he just doesn't show any emotions mm. um, and then yeah, then we went to sort of you know separate and he just he was clinging on to me it was like <laughs> yeah it was it was like um maybe a third like a 30 second hug I yeah don't know. yeah really yeah nifty. he was just um yeah, it, it all, you know, I think that it was the first real moment that w- that he, you know, he'd won a major championship, came off the green on the 18th there, and, you know, mum or dad are not standing mm. there. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was a big moment, but... Um, yeah, and then, then he went over to um, Elan, his wife at the time, and, yeah, broke down. Broke yeah, down so no one had ever seen that side yeah. of Tiger. So, you know, that was a, you know, a, 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 an emotional win for sure, mm. and he sh- showed a different side of Tiger to the rest of the world. Yeah. What, what are your memories of Earl and Tita? Tita? Is it Tita? Yeah. yeah with yeah. the big visor. Yeah, no, uh, um, Tita came from Thailand. She was a Thai lady, and, and Tiger's father was a ex military guy. And that, and um, yeah, they, 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 you know, they, they were very mm. sort of average, normal talk type people to me. I mean, I went to Earl's house a couple of times and that, and he just lived in a normal neighborhood in, in California near the Army golf course where. Tiger grew up and played, and um, yeah, they were just no, sort of normal mm. people that, that um, you know, obviously they saw a tremendous talent in Tiger. And um, well, they had like it's almost like he was groomed to be a champion, wasn't he? Yeah, it was like Earl's project, yeah, exactly. But um, 
you know the most important thing that you you, you learn from when you see parents like that is that you know they never pushed Tiger, mm. they they encouraged him, but they never pushed him, and I think that's a very big thing for a lot of parents to realize that you know you can't push your kids and make them do something you you, you got to encourage them and, and hope that they do it and, and advise them but you, you just certainly can't yeah. push them and i think a lot of parents are guilty of that mm. have you read the andre agassi book open i haven't yeah. read that book yeah loathes tennis apparently <laughs> because his dad made him play i wondered if it was the same sort of thing with tiger where you have a conflicted relationship with the sport because you know the your entry into it, but I, I don't think that's the case with Tiger. No, no, no. I mean, he he, uh, he loves the history of the game. He loves yeah. the game, but um, yeah, no. His, his his dad made it fun, made it enjoyable, and, and made it competitive for him. Mm. Yeah. And is it true that Tita called Phil Mickelson hefty lefty? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that true? Is that just a? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, there was a few. Um, did you, did you and Tiger call him bitch tits or no? Am I making that up? Look, I mean, <laughs> no the, comment. No, like I, I didn't know that, but look, I, one of the funniest things I've ever seen on a golf course was in New York, um, at Bethpage Black when they played the U.S. Open there, and of course New York people were very raucous, loud, and you know some people might even describe them as being as noxious. Um, so on the seventeenth hole at the U.S. Open, there Tiger on the Saturday afternoon, he's playing with Phil Mickelson, packed stand, and at the that particular point in time, I'd never seen a grandstand bigger than one of the grandstands that was erected on the 17th hole there. It was huge, the amount of people in it. So the players are walking down to, from the par, to par three. They're walking from the tee to the green, and there's one guy standing up at the top of the grandstand. He yells out as loud as he can, Hey, Phil! And, you know, Phil doesn't even look up. Hey, Phil! Doesn't look up again. He goes, Hey, Mr. Mickelson! And Phil looks up to this guy and says, Nice tits, Phil! <laughs> And there would have been two or three thousand people in this one grandstand. And, and, and if, if, if Phil could have gone into a bunker and pulled a cover over it, he would have done that. I've never seen a guy felt more out of place than he did right there. I mean, and of course, we, Tiger and I were just pissing ourselves. So, um, yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was very funny. Yeah. And um, so, November 2007, um, that, that's when Tiger had the car crash on the sleeping pills. Um, and the scandal broke. Where were you? Were you in New Zealand at the time? Yeah, yeah. What are, you, what are your recollections of that? <laughs> I was, I, I can, I was, uh, I was on a tractor, um, on a slasher, slashing one of my paddocks, and I, I, I was listening to the radio. and It was on the news, so that, yeah, that's, um, mm. that's, uh, that's, that's how I came to, to hear about that. Yeah, and then it sort of unravels as the, the days and weeks went on. Um, how, 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 what sort of impact did that have, have on you? That scandal in that time. I can't imagine it was easy for you. I remember at the time there were. You said you knew nothing about it, and people were saying that that's that's hard to fathom. Um, I would say to friends at the time, it's absolutely not hard to fathom, especially like if you if you if your best mate's a straight up and down guy like Steve is, and you know you're doing something wrong, you're going to do what you can to keep it from him. Because I'm guessing Tiger knew that if you knew, you'd be like Tiger, this is fucked up. Um, if, if it carries on, I'm going to have to tell Elon or do something about yeah, it. Yeah, that, that's 100% the yeah. synopsis. I mean, so many people thought as much time as we spent together, you caddy for a guy, you spend that many days with a guy, how is that not possible you know what's going on? I had zero idea what was going on. And that. And look, Tiger's a mate of mine, and everybody makes mistakes, and it just happens mm -hmm. to be that you know he, he's a person, and a high-profile person. He, you know, Everybody makes mistakes. So as a friend and, and, and as a, someone that worked for him, you know, I just wanted to support him 100% mm -hmm. and said, um, you know, whatever it takes to help you, whatever, I'm there for you. Um, yeah, I mean, people, the comments and everything, I mean, it's just, you you got to be thick-skinned to be a caddy, for one, so that helps, you know, like if you... If you if you're not thick-skinned, you're not going to be successful at Kelly, but you certainly need thick skin after that incident mm. where all the scandal broke through and everything, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what about your relationship with your wife? Yeah, look, was that, I mean, was that Was that te tested at the time? Oh, I mean, there's no question that that, 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 was, that was testing, but mm. uh, my wife is very understanding, and, and, and she's great friends with Elon, mm. and, that, and, and, you know, she understood that, you know, Tiger's made a big mistake here and, and so forth. But, you know, we were friends with them. We were very good friends with them. And we just tried to support them the best we can. You know, Kirsty's very intelligent and, and helped me through that as well. But, you know, it was difficult. Jep, my son, was going to school and, you know, people were saying things about, oh, you know, your dad's this and your dad's that, you know, with no, no nothing to back up what they're saying and that. So it was, you know, definitely a difficult period. But, um, yeah, it was a shame because at the end of the day, that – that whole thing sort of snowballed and, and, and long term that was the, probably the major reason 
why Tiger hasn't gone on to win, the, mm. you know, the 18 major championships. I mean, you know, th things led to him doing some other activities and he got injured and, you know, so mm. forth. And um, I, I guess he, during that whole period when he was under a lot of stress himself and that he was probably working out way too much and his body was probably, you know, not going to be in perfect tune for golf and he got, you know, started to get niggling injuries and... And it shortened his career. Had that whole thing not eventuated, and that, um, you know, I'd be more than willing to think that he would have won those yeah. extra majors and carried on. But it's 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 a sad end to a, what is an you know one of the greatest sporting stories ever. I mean, he dominated golf, and he's a you know an incredible player and that. But yeah, it's a shame he didn't go on to realize what his dream was. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, uh, so after that, there was um, he was in rehab for sex addi addiction, and then um, he had to do this TV statement thing. And you, you, so this was twenty ten, I think. You look back now with thirteen years hindsight, it was very weird. Like he was he was a bad husband, um, he he was unfaithful, but to have to like stand in front of a room of people and make a prepared statement and look as solemn as you can in front of a bunch of people that had nothing to do with it looking disapproving at you, that's fucked up. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, look, I, to be honest, I, I don't even know why he was had to do that. I mean, you Must don't have been have, advice from... Yeah, I mean, you don't have to answer anybody. You answer to your, to your yeah. family and your friends and your sponsors. No, you don't have to answer to anybody. So I, I found that as weird as anybody else probably found it. Mm. Yeah, and, and then so then after that it was the 2010 Masters, so he came back and came back fairly quickly and played. How did you guys? How did you guys get on then? 2010. Yeah, he played actually. Um, surprisingly, um, he opened up with a couple of very good rounds there, uh, having not, um, you know, been playing that that much on the tour. Obviously, he was practicing and playing at home. But um, yeah, look, I mean, it's amazing. The the crowd was so much behind him, um, and that and. Um, yeah, we 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 we, we, we I, you know got back on, uh, and we away we went again. Mm. Yeah, you know, I had um um. Do you know Millie Kerr, the cricketer? Yeah, yeah. I had her on the podcast a few weeks ago, and she's um. We talked in quite quite a, quite quite a bit of depth about her mental health issues and you know the anxiety she suffers and stuff like that. And she said when she's um playing cricket, that's the one time that it goes away because it's like her happy place. Maybe it's the same with Tiger. He just wanted to get the fuck back out there as soon as what he could. Yeah, look, I mean, you, uh, when you go and play professional golf and you're playing on the PGA Tour or any other tour and that, to do to be successful, you've got to be totally focused. And um, Tiger always said that he was very good at compartmentalising things. That was one of his strengths, to be able to put things aside, whether it be whatever it was. You know, he, he, he might have been working on a golf course design, he might have been working on something else and that, but he, he had that ability to compartmentalise things and solely focus on the job in hand. But I think any person, their happy place is where they, you know, obviously they're always hap happily at with their family and home, but their, their, their place that they, they get their excitement, their joy, and, and is living their dream mm -hmm. on, on doing what they do best. And that's for him, that was playing golf. And, you know, just, he loved competing more than anyone that I'd ever seen. I mean, he's just a different breed of, of competitor. He, he just hated to lose and his only satisfaction came from winning. So some players might be happy if they finish in the top three, top five, top ten, top twenty. I mean, unless he won, he wasn't happy. So, you know, every week going, you know, I mean, his winning percentage was unbelievable. But... Yeah, it's never going to be repeated, is it? It's never yeah. going to be repeated. Yeah. But, I mean, when you're caring for a guy that, you know, like some guys do finish with a top ten, you know, and you shake hands in the week, you know, good, you know, good week, top ten, yep. And that, but you could never ever say that it was only a good week if you won. <laughs> so you know, every week was a failure unless you won. So I mean, the second place is the first loser. So yeah, that. absolutely. But I mean, he he um yeah, it, it's it was stressful getting for him. You know, it was obviously fun, but just knowing every week that if it, unless you won, won the tournament, it wasn't a success. So the the, the, the pressure was. You know, monumental yeah and then, then what happened to you guys in the end so he was having a break from golf and you, you that's when you started working with adam scott it was yeah. gonna be like a like a fling i guess yeah a bit on the side yeah so uh, tiger when he came back he uh, then, then he was having some injury problems and so forth and anyway so we, we tiger was due to play the congressional open uh the sorry the u.s open at congressional and I, i'd left new zealand here my father-in-law came with me and i had another mate with me and we were going to that tournament 
And Tiger hadn't played in a few weeks and that, but he was adamant he was going to play in the tournament. Great. And then he announced on the Friday that he wasn't playing in the tournament. We had already left New Zealand to head to that tournament. I had, like I said, a father-in-law with me and another friend with me. And just happened to be that Adam Scott called me and said, hey, Steve, I see Tiger's pulled out of the tournament. Any chance you could carry for me? And I said, yeah, I think that should be right. I rang Tiger and he said, yep, no problem. You know, I don't have a problem with that. And um, so that's all good. We get prepared to go. We'd fly into America and then we were going onwards to um, Washington to, to Congressional and then Tiger changed his mind. And well, we you know we'd already got there, so mm. and I had my father-in-law, like I said, and a friend with me, and and, and I'd, I'd already told Adam yes, and I thought, well, I said, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, I, I, what's the big deal? I'm going to carry for the guy. I mean, I, I didn't see any, I didn't see any big deal about it, and um, yeah, I went and carried for him, and that was the end of the story. T- Tiger, for one reason or another, he 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 told me yes and then and he disapproved it and I you know he basically said to me well if you go ahead and do it I'll fly you and I, I actually kind of thought he was joking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah it seems a little drastic it, oh, it did it, 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 you know it got me by surprise I you know I'd, I'd supported him and done a, what I felt like was a great job of everything did everything he ever asked me to do and you know I just mm. thought that was a bit unusual yeah. so and do, does it does he is that done by text does he call um no, that well, he wasn't at the tournament, right? Yeah, so. Uh, Wait, how do you hear you've lost the job? Well, then a, a, a week or so later, um, the next tournament, um, his foundation is a, a, the tournament benefits his foundation, and he was at that tournament but not playing, and then that's when you know mm. when we sat down, and that was the end of it. So, but I mean. Look, when you're caring for somebody, you know, things change and things move on. I, I knew straight away, to be honest, when I went back to caring for Tiger, that we didn't have the same chemistry because he he ultimately probably, even though we're great mates and everything, he, he as you alluded to, he kept that a secret to me because he knows I'm a stand-up kind of mm. bloke. And I, I guess even though I felt... embarrassed about how he... Behaved. Correct. Yeah, and even though you know we are great mates now, I could sense that he could sense that you know my own opinion of him had probably changed, mm. and that, um, and you know, he, he, he like you said, and it's a hundred percent correct, mm. is that he did everything he could to make sure that I didn't know what yeah. was going on. Yeah, and um, but. Yeah, it's quite sad though. Eh? When you go through so much together, you go, you, you know, you basically go to war with each other for for ten ten years or whatever it is. You win, have so much success together, and then for the relationship to, you, you, I don't know, you know what I mean? To yeah. not be able to sit down, sit down at a tournament now with cigars and reflect on what you went through, it seems quite sad. Yeah, no, you don't really look at it like that. It's because really? it's no, nah, I mean, yeah, you know, because in the role of a caddy, it, it it frequently changes and things. You know, the caddies get hired and fired all the time, and that. So, you know, in in some respect, it was good to um, get away from that atmosphere. You know, that that whole mm. caddying for Tiger thing because the pressure is immense. Mm. I mean, but then then then, it, then came along a great new challenge because. Adam and I had always been quite tight as well, um, just friends with Adam, and that, and, and it presented a new challenge. And I'd always wondered why he didn't play better than he than he did, particularly in major championships. So that actually presented a new challenge, and that was fresh. And um, yeah, mm. so so um, are you and Tiger still in touch? Like, did you call or text him after the car accident in twenty twenty one or no? We uh, two thousand nineteen <laughs> majors win. Do you? We've had no. Um, no contact. There's a problem with a guy like Tiger and, and numerous guys like him. They change their phone number so often, so <laughs> you can't get their phone number. Yeah. You know, obviously had his number at the time, but um, you, you can't get their phone number. You know, he changes his phone number frequently. You know, mm. because well, I think I think that's sad. I know you say it's just the life of a caddy, but fuck you. You guys did some stuff together. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was um, yeah. It, it's just the way it panned out, and then um, this year. Um, we were actually going to get together at the US Open. Um, I was telling Tiger about my son, who was asking about my son, what he's up to, and I said, well, actually, he's going to be at the US Open. Um, this is when I was talking to a Tiger at Augusta. Um, but in the end, you know, Tiger, didn't, he, pl- he played at Augusta, and then he hasn't played since. So we were going to get together and um, 
you know, I, I don't know what was going to happen, but <laughs> we, we had planned to sit down mm. and then, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so at, at Adam Scott, you guys start working together. I heard him on a podcast talking about a story where uh, he said he was going to pick you up from Heathrow. And uh, apparently it was like the tiger story you told before. He was rugged up and you were wearing shorts and a singlet or something. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Who, by the way, who arrives at Heathrow in shorts and a singlet? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm always, you know, like a a Adam, pl <laughs> he plays with the jumper on when it's 25 degrees, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, we, the, the, so we, when... After I'd caddied for Adam at that US Open and that and um, the next tournament he was playing in that which I agreed to caddy for was the British Open and, and everything and, and he picked me up at the airport which what I, I felt was just you know here's a guy a golfing superstar is going to drive and pick me up at the airport and take me to the to, to where we're going to like it's just something that players don't well, do. Like literally drove and picked you up himself didn't send a car. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, like no. Well, that shows a huge amount of respect. It I did. I was yeah, it was something. I, it was always special. Yeah. So. Um, mm. And then, so so you you and Adam, we touched upon this at the beginning, the 2013 Masters, you won that, which is massive for him, massive for Australia, massive for you. Um, what did that celebration look like <laughs> compared to the one where Tiger won by uh, the US Open by 15 shots? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we, we were all staying in a house at Augusta, uh, his manager, his coach, uh, myself, and um, Adam's family were there, um, and... Adam had quite a few mates and so forth. So yeah, it was it was um, yeah it was it wasn't a huge celebration. They have a champions dinner that night, so a Adam has to you know he has to go back to the club and go to the to the dinner. Um, but he's not sending you off to the next tournament to scope. It. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a bit there was no, no no thought like that. Yeah. So, uh, and then um, so what's your status now? Because you retired in 2019, but it feels like you're you're always back and forth. You you retire you. You're retiring more than Jay Z. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you you retire and then you get guys that, you know, Jason Day, like almost uh, not, I don't know the right words, big, but was really wanted me to come and carry for him for a few tournaments, and, and I did. And then Adam Scott this year um, asked me to come and carry for a few tournaments and that. So, yeah, whilst you're retired and that, you get an opportunity to sometimes go back and carry a few tournaments and that, and it's quite fun to do. But, like, as far as doing it for a full-time job, no, I'm completely away from caddying full-time. But, I mean, every now and again, like I hope, you know, caddy for Ryan Fox every now and again. Mm. Um, but, yeah, just fill in, I guess, for guys. Yeah, you still enjoy it when you do it occasionally, when you dabble? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's fun to, like, the game constantly evolves. You, you don't realise when you're, working in something you know it's evolving while you're there you don't probably see it evolve but when you step away for a little bit and come back you know the, the, it, there's always some changes in, 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 in what the players are thinking what their equipment is using you know the new balls the new clubs the new shafts and things yeah it's quite good to mm. it's an evolving game like all sports so um yeah it's fun Who, who's the who's the guy that's really good that's got a terrible swing what's his name um uh, De Deschambe or something? No, what's oh, his? Bryson Deschambe. Yeah, is yeah. he the one that's got a really weird swing? Well, he's just, he, he, he uses clubs that are, he uses cl one length club. Every club's the same length. He has very thick grips and he, and he, and he takes an almighty swipe at it. But, um, yeah, a it's super... effective though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he's a super impressive player, for mm. sure. Um, so, so for Steve Williams now, what does like an average day or week look like? Yeah, so uh, I still keep... Uh, very busy. We've had my foundation running for quite a number of years, and that, and mm. um, I'm running a big charity event at um, Paradise Valley Speedway in Rotorua uh, in December, where we've got 12 motorsports celebrities driving super stock cars. We've got Hayden Patton, Greg Murphy, mm. Andre Heimgartner, Aaron Slight, and a whole bunch of guys driving super stocks, uh, which they've never done before. And it's a charity meeting, so I've been putting that together and. Um, my son is a professional scooter rider, which is a sport that not many people realise it's a professional sport. It's a <laughs> yeah, you know, it yeah, we had this chat before we sat down. So he's 17, and we're not talking like lime scooters with the <laughs> motors. We're talking like the, the little um, chrome razor scooters. Yeah, they're not quite parts. razor scooters, but they're, they're, they're similar to those, and they're, they're, they compete in, in, in bowls and, and skate parks, ramps and big ramps and and so forth, indoor, outdoor oh. skate parks and that. So it's a very big sport in Europe and the United States so to compete he has to go overseas a lot so we've been going overseas a lot with him mm. um, to compete and that's what he wants to do he's absolutely passionate about it um, 
and yeah. So yeah, how, many, how many kids have you got? Just the one. Just the yeah. one. So he's fortunate because yeah. we, uh, with his age, my, myself and my wife have to go with him. Um, you know, he can't go on his own. Mm. He's not probably not as worldly as his dad was. But how how, how old are you now? I'm sixty, so right. um, Jeez, you look, you're you're still looking fit. And, <laughs> yeah. and you must, from all the travel you did, you must have like so many banked years <laughs> with air points and things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but um, no, you, you know, you keep yourself busy. There's yeah. always always something on the go. Mm. So your relationship with your son good? I'm guessing you missed you probably missed a lot in the very early years, right? Yeah, yeah. Look, it, 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 it's great to uh, like he he he's um, I I guess he's a chip off the old block a little bit he's he's very very dedicated to what he does and he's, he's fortunate that he's you know he's a very good athlete whatever sport he's taken up um, he's been very good at but he's taken a huge liking to the scootering and my wife and I didn't really know anything about it uh, we didn't know it was a professional sport and you can do it overseas um, and through one thing or another taking him um, he won the New Zealand champs here uh, a couple of years in a row, and then went overseas. And, and you know he's been going good right. o- overseas. So um, it's a sport that requires a lot of dedication, a lot of training, and he's he, he's up to the task. Um, so my wife and I are thrilled to be part of his journey, and, it, and it's good having had a lot of knowledge from various amount of sports people that I've not only worked for but been around. And you, you know you, you have a fairly good understanding of what it takes to be good at something and what's required in that. So scootering's a sport that I know nothing about, so <laughs> it, it's quite good just to sort of work with him on sort of the mental side of it and the strategy. Um, but to, you know, to watch your son compete, um, at something that, you know, he's passionate about and very good at. So, yeah, and no, we're pretty excited about it. He, his ultimate goal, he wants to be the best in the world. Mm. So... Um, he just recently returned from the world champs and he finished 10th in that. So uh, we were pretty stoked with that. He was stoked with that as well. Um, you know, he's only starting out in the sport, yeah. so he's he, he's he's on the right track. So, yeah, my wife, she looks after him and, and, and get, gets all them organised. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, how did, how did you guys meet? You and Kirsty? Um, I was having a charity event uh, for, my, for our foundation at Waikanae Golf Club. Um, on the Cavity Coast, Kirsty was a member there, and she was playing in a team uh, there, and that's how we met. Mm. So um, I, I guess it's one of those things, love at first sight. Kind was of it thing. really? Yeah, and then yeah. Went, like you, you know, you've got to have someone that's very understanding of what you do and what, what's required and the pressure involved in that. But you know, I think everybody, every good sports person. Um, knows that you've got to find the right person that understands what you're trying to accomplish and you know t- i guess sometimes that person has to take a little bit of a back seat to let you do what you want to do and accomplish because they've got to make sacrifices and you know it's a pretty special person yeah. to make sacrifices yeah. and yeah, and she must have made so many sacrifices so, so now when you get off the phone from say like adam or ryan or whoever and they're asking you to come back for one more round do you have to like take a deep breath before you go hey kirsty <laughs> <laughs> oh I so did. i was just wondering yeah that's exactly how it goes <laughs> <laughs> but then like if you if you if it's so, if it's somewhere nice like you know maybe the tournament's on the gold coast or it's down in queenstown yeah. well it's good because it's fun for all of us yeah yeah yeah, yeah off here um oh you mentioned your, this charity event that you're running before yeah we haven't even got onto that yet you've um, I mean, you've made a lot of money over the years. I think for a time there, you were you were recognised as New Zealand's highest paid sports person, so you, or, or higher earning more than any other sports person in New Zealand. But you're also very altruistic. Um, yeah, a one million dollar donation to Starship in two thousand and eight. Yeah, I mean, look, people have always, you know, seem fixated on the money, um, but you don't. You don't when you you know I've caddied since I was. You know, since 1976, when I was 13 years of age, and it was never about the money. It's about a game that you love. I love the game of golf, and I love caddying. And it's just fortunate that you get to be good at what you do, and and, and the money comes along with it. But it was never ever about the money for me, no. I and it never has been. In that, and yeah, it's like um, my wife came up with a very good project um, that the Starship Oncology Unit needed was needed a founding donor to start their rebuild program to get the ball rolling in that. And, um, yeah, we, we, we pledged a million dollars to get that ball rolling. And, you know, it, it's fortunate to be able to give that kind of money away. And, you know, I'm not a person that needs a lot of money. So, yes, it's a lot of money, but it's also, you know, 
if someone asked me what's your career highlight, I'd say it's that. Yeah. You know, to be able to walk into that oncology unit at the Starship Hospital and it has my wife and Kirsty and my, myself's name uh, on top of the unit there. Um, yeah, we're pr that's something probably more proud of than anything, to be honest. Oh no, shut as well. You should be as well, because I mean, it's not like it's not like you're, you, you know, it's not like you're a billionaire or anything. So a million dollars is um, a million dollars is a lot of money for anyone. Yeah, a million I, dollars is a lot of money for Tiger Woods, but you that, know, a million dollars for Stephen Kirsty Woods of Waiuku is it's a, it's a good thing you did. It's a yeah, bloody good thing. It, it is a good thing, but it, uh, it helps a lot of people. Yeah, you know, and. Um, you know, we've had so many people come up to us and say, you know, that that, that, that unit is so good now compared to what it used to be. And uh, we thank you so much for that and that. But, um, you know, no, my wife and I, it was her idea. And, um, yeah, it's a substantial amount of money. We, we know that. But it's great to be able to do that, you mm. know. It, mm. Yeah. And, and um, New Zealand Order of Merit, you got acknowledged on that as well. Was that for the donation or was that for services to golf? Yeah, was? That was, I think it was just a bit of everything. Yeah. You know, um, we, we, we've, through my foundation, that we've supported a lot of junior golfers throughout the country and we've been heavily involved in, in, in Speedway and, you know, gen, all, all youth Speedway uh, through the foundation and, and um yeah, and, and then our association with the Starship mm. Hospital. So, yeah, that's a sort of bit of a humbling thing to get yeah. made an order yeah. of merit thing. So, it, it, yeah, it, does, 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 yeah, do you care about it? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just nice that you, you know, like you, you mentioned to me a little earlier about, you know, Earl Woods, Tiger's father. Uh, w one thing that he was instrumental with is that he said, Steve, when you care for my son, Tiger, you're going to become very famous yourself. I don't like that word. People say you're famous. I don't. I like the more the term of you know well known. I don't mm. like that word. I don't think anyone's famous. Some people are just more well known than others. But he said, Steve, you're going to be very well known. And this is where the idea of the foundation came along. Uh, he said, you know, you'll have the opportunity to make some difference in some other people's lives and that. And um, yeah, he was he was amazing to talk to. I I guess had never had the idea of what what a foundation was how you run a foundation and that so my wife and i um, took that on board and and she got the ball rolling um and we went to gisborne speedway on boxing day one year every day i'd go every year we, we'd have a circuit around christmas time and uh, we were driving to gisborne and my uh, on Christmas Day, which my wife hated and rightfully so, <laughs> so I could go and you know do my speedway passion, and and she said, um, you know what we're going to do? She, she said tomorrow morning we're going to we're going to go into the warehouse and we're going to get all these boxes of chocolates and we're going to go into one of the local hospitals there and hand them out to all the kids. Well, that's great, and we did that, and that was so rewarding, mm. absolutely rewarding, and and the next night we uh, after we'd raced in Gisborne we were driving to Napier for the next race meeting and my wife was looking on how uh, on different things and that and she came across how the the Starship Hospital was needing a founding donor to get this you know when they set up a project that they get a founding donor to set to, to set the um, the bar started and, and to raise the money for the project and, that, and that's how it started mm -hmm. so it was all my wife and we got that and then that's how it, how yeah. it started. Were you ever acknowledged by the um, the, you know, the Helbig Foundation or the Helbig Sports Awards uh, over all your years? Um, is, is there an award for like um, a sporting support or admi some sort of administration? Yeah, no, or not, not not through that. Does that piss uh, you off? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I've you know I've been got the Wellington, been the Wellington Sports Person of the Year, the Capity Sports Person of the Year, the Caddy Hall of Fame, all that kind of thing. It's you don't you don't you're not doing it to make money you're not doing it to get recognition you're doing it because you love the game that's i just love golf i've been on a, the golf course you know since i was five years old i just love the game i mean it, it wouldn't make any difference to me whether i'd not carry for tiger woods adam scott ray floyd gregor who i just love being on the golf course you know you have as much fun caddying for a, a weekend hacker as it is to a pro you know i mean i just love caddying it, it's hard to explain where the love and how much i loved caddying mm. yeah Oh, that's so special. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean... I, I, yeah, I, I, and I believe you when you say that. Like, it'd be easy f to sit here and go, oh, this guy's... He's a disgruntled golfer. <laughs> you know, there's a saying that if you can't do it, teach. But I, I genuinely believe you. 
Yeah, just I mean, I love being on the bag. Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I, I was as a junior, I, I was you know pretty decent myself. I was on a two handicap when I was thirteen, so there's nothing to suggest that maybe I couldn't have been a golf pro. I mean, I played rugby at the highest level I could play when I was a kid. Played the New Zealand schoolboys. Um, you know, when I was 12 years old and that, so I played that game at the, at the highest level that I could achieve. Mm. Um, and then, but the, the catting was something, you know, it's, when you, you know, you, I was almost embarrassed when I first started catting in, in my early teenage years to tell people I was a golf caddy because nobody knew anything about it. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm, I, you're what? You're a golf caddy? What is that? You know, I used to live in Devonport and then they'd say, oh, we, we, do, do you caddy at Wider Matter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I ride my bike down there every day yeah. and I caddy at Wider Matter. But it, it just, I, I got to the point where I, I didn't tell people I was a caddy for a long time mm-hmm. that because no one knew anything about it and they seemed, uh, they, it was just such a strange thing to say because they didn't know anyone. Like if you say I'm a mechanic, I'm a bulldozer driver, a truck driver, yeah. an electrician, computer, IT guy, whatever it might be, you know someone that does it. Yeah, it's, t- it's tangible, yeah. Yeah, but you tell someone you're a caddy, it's like, what's that? Mm. <laughs> and, and have you got any memorabilia from that time? Like your, your white um, overalls from the majors, you kept any of them or have you just given everything away for charity auctions? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a big person on memorabilia, and people find that fascinating. If you mm. walked into our house, you would have no idea that I ever worked as a golf caddy. There's not one bit of memorabilia anywhere. I've only like, a, like a man cave or a game room well, or anything? Or? Yeah, I, I do, but uh, nobody goes in it. <laughs> <laughs> only me. But I, the, 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 a typical thing that caddies do is keep the flags. You know, when the player wins the tournament, you remove the flag off the pole and keep that and you get the player to sign it and so forth so that's one thing I've done I've kept all the flags but um, a lot of guys have an enormous amount of memorabilia you know I've been fortunate to caddy in the Ryder Cup a lot of times and and the President's Cup a lot of time and um, yeah I've I've kept none of the memorabilia I'm just not you know that's just not Mm -hmm. me Sort of thing, yeah. So what's in your, what's in your man cave at home? You got the, the flags on the wall? Yeah, just the yeah. flags and, 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 so and from the Masters. Well, all all the tournaments, right. you know, like you know, you know, I've, I've kept every flag from every tournament I've won. Right. You know, so it's a lot of flags. Why, uh, why does no one go in there? Do you, do you not let anyone in there, or <laughs> is it just your own special space? Oh, look, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you just. That's a very good question. I don't know. I, I, I think I'd have um, I'd have goosebumps standing in that space. Like the stuff that you guys did together, it's it's phenomenal. And as we've established time and time again, it's never going to be repeated. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I mean, you, you keep all the best memories in your head, so that's kind of what I've done. That, but um, but as we get older, the head's not so reliable. Oh, you've got that right. <laughs> <laughs> any any um any regrets or any, anything you do differently? Oh, look, apart I, from not talking about um, that part to Ray Floyd. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I guess I probably, you know, to make life easier on myself, I should have moved to America and, and lived in America because traveling back and forth um, was definitely difficult. But you know, when you, I, I'm passionate about New Zealand, I love everything about New Zealand, and you know, every time I, when the plane touched down at home, when I come back from America, I always had this tingling sensation mm. that you know, just like oh, I'm home now. You know, I don't know, I just love New Zealand. But no, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I, I, I love the game of golf. I'm fortunate to have been in it my whole entire life. And, um, yeah, it, it's been great. Met a lot of great people, caddy for a lot of great players. And then, you know, been up hand, up close to arguably the guy that's played golf at the highest level. And oh. we'll never see another guy like Tiger Woods. I don't think there's any argument about it. Yeah. Um, not, not, not just a great golfer, but like one of those... Um, well, he's got one name. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's Madonna, Oprah, Tiger. Yeah, yeah, y- yeah. You know, like just a just a generation defining a- athlete. It's amazing, and y- you were there. Like, I think for a lot of guys that are into golf, like their their bucket list thing would be to you know, go and walk around Augusta. But you're talking about being in the the gallery with thousands of other people, walking from hole to hole. You were on. You were the guy on the fairway for years and years and years. You know, front row seat to the best golfer in the world. Yeah, look, I mean. It's only when you step away from it. It's only been probably in the last couple of years that since I've retired and that. And you, because we, when you're catting, you, you know, you're always on to the next week. You, 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 it doesn't matter who you're catting for, you're on to the next tournament and, that, and, and you're always trying to work out how we can get better, how, how you know, what can we do to get better this week and so forth. I'm always big on, uh, on stats and keeping my own kind of stats as to all the different shots the players hit and, that and how you can improve and sort of thing. But it's only been since I've stepped away from the game a little bit that I've had time to reflect. Um, 
you know, on the on the journey, and you know, obviously been fortunate to carry for some good players, but you know, in particular to carry for the guy that's arguably the greatest player that's ever played the game, and arguably one of the greatest sports stars ever. Um, to be have the front row seat and be part of that is is very special and mm. something that um, is very memorable. Obviously, yeah. Actually, actually, not just a front row seat, but you know, like a, an advisor role as well, like part of the success. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's good because we had such a great relationship yeah. in that, and and, and you know, there's, there's several tournaments that you know I was adamant on the last hole that you know, I know what I'm talking about here, Ty. You just got to trust me. And that and and you know he'd go with that and um, you know win the tournament. So you know he he, he um, you know like his generosity and his thankfulness it, it was mm. amazing. How you know that, that that went with him. Yeah. What, what did it, like a, a bonus look like or a Christmas present? Oh look, I mean he, he invited um, my whole family, not just myself, but my mum and dad, the whole the whole nine yards take his boat for a week wherever he wanted to <laughs> like it was yeah so um, a little a little tinny a little runabout <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he's got a he's got an amazing boat and, and we yeah it's called called privacy pri- privacy yes. yeah so yeah. We, we had we we took that to the caribbean for a week and you know lived large for a week on that and that and um you oh know my god he's chucked me the keys to a couple of different cars and you know just like a you know when you work with somebody and you have have big success, he, he made you feel pretty special too, mm. which was nice. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And who's Fred Fred Rama? <laughs> um, I'm a big sprint car fan. Um, obviously, uh, you know I, I raced myself for a number of years, but I, I follow sprint car racing big time. Uh, and Freddie Ramo is a Hall of Famer sprint car driver out of Pennsylvania, and he's he, he's my number one guy. He's actually retired now, and his two he, his two sons race. But um, for a number of years, uh, I frequented, or not every year I go and see the Ramers out of Pennsylvania, the sprint car team, and you know, not, I'm passionate about it. I love sprint car mm. racing. Please tell me you've got a selfie with Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've, I do have a photo with Freddie. And yes! Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he, I'd, never driven a, I'd never driven a sprint car. Mm. I, I drove su- saloons and super saloons back in New Zealand here, and every year I go to the racetrack with them, and, that, and, and, and one night he, he made me drive the car uh, after the race meeting and that, so that was pretty exciting. Got some pretty cool, but uh, yeah, and, and was quite surprised to got this car up to speed quite quickly, so I was pretty impressed with that, yeah. Mm. Well, how good. Hey, well, thank you so much for coming over today and coming on the podcast. I've probably taken up enough of your time. I could pick your brains and listen to your stories for, for days. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. What a career, what a life. Yeah, no, look, it's great to be on your podcast. Mm. That I know it's a hugely popular podcast. My fan, my wife is a big fan of yours, so when I told her that I was coming in, she was pretty excited. But, uh, yeah, look, it's nice to share, you know, your, your story with us. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big person in believing that anything's achievable. I always wanted to be a caddy and I always wanted to caddy in the major championships and, and, and I was successful in doing that and I'm a great believer and I think uh, you know too many, too many young people get told by others that you, you know you can't do this or you can't do that everything is achievable that's what I, and I, I'm a great believer in telling kids that if you if you believe you can do something and, and you are dedicated to the task you can do anything mm. um, so and I'm, I, it's exactly the same sentiment that I'm with my son that he wants to be the best scooter rider in the world well if you put your mind to it and you do what it takes to get there you can do it and that applies to any kid yeah. in any sport that they do so I, I love telling kids that you know you've got to dream high and one of my big things is, uh, and I, and this probably came from Tiger, is that like the day that I went to interview with Tiger, not interview, but talk about caring for him, you know, he, he had one list, uh, he had two lists on his wall. One is all Jack Nicholas's achievement through his amateur career, his pro career. And on the other side, Tiger had up until the time where he was, where he had matched Jack and that. So, you know, he knew Jack was the benchmark and he, and he was, you know, trying to better that throughout every stage of his career and I'm huge on writing down goals mm. and um, you know my son does that he, he does it daily weekly monthly yearly and I, I tell all kids in that um, that's what you want to do is yeah. write your goals down so that you can see them every day what am I trying to achieve today what is it I'm trying to achieve this week this month and this year and, and you know you give yourself a pat on the back you celebrate when you succeed and then when you don't you work harder mm. you know when you haven't got to where you can why didn't I get there? evaluate why I didn't get there, work harder to get to the next level and 
yeah, so um, yeah, I'm fortunate to have worked for some very good athletes and had the opportunity to talk to a number of leading athletes in other sports because of the people that I've been associated with, and I've, I haven't, you know, I've, I've picked their brains and um, got a lot of good information. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm guessing one of the one of the common threads you found with all those people, whether it's um, you know Jack Nicholas, Jordan, whoever, it's hard work. There's, there's nothing replaces hard yeah. work, and that's what you know. That's the I, superpower. I, that's what people don't realise. Like you know, caring for someone like Tiger Woods is obviously an enjoyable job, but the, the hard work that he puts in, the practice that he put in, the dedication that he put in, and the drills that he had out that he had to do every day to succeed in what he wanted to do, you don't see that kind of work. I mean, mm. everybody. It doesn't matter what the Tiger was. Everybody that gets to the top echelon of the sport. What is the common thread? Well, it's hard work and dedication. Sure, you've got to have talent. I mean, everybody's got to have talent. But you've got you've got to be so dedicated to the task, and you, you can't replace hard work. I mean, Michael mm. Jordan will tell you that. You know, it, yeah. it, I mean, like he, I, I love talking to him about, you know, the, the practice and you know, Eric Murray. You've, I don't know if you've had Eric. Yeah, Murray had him on, on the him. podcast. He was great, um, and, and he he's a great guy to talk to. My son was involved in rowing, and that, and, and, and you know, Eric said I was unorthodox. Might not have been the biggest guy, not might not have been the strongest guy, but I outworked every guy. Mm. And when I got onto that. Onto the you know the starting um, and the boys to start and I'd look across there I'd, he'd know that I'd he he knew that he'd worked harder than all of mm -hmm. them and I'm going to beat you because I've worked harder and that you know there's just no substitute yeah. for hard work and it, it is quite disappointing when you realise natural talent is sort of a myth eh like <laughs> it, there can be a certain level of natural talent but without hard work you're not going to get anywhere yeah some some guys are gifted. W with yeah. some natural talent. I mean, I cave for Adam Scott there. He's probably one of the most naturally gifted golfers there ever has been. Mm. But has he has he further, you know, could he have been better with hard work? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, so. Mm. Well, one, one final question. So I'm from, um, I'm, I'm 10 years younger than you, but I'm from Palmerston North, and we used to go down to Padapadaumu quite a bit, and there was a hydro slide there on the waterfront. And um, mum, one day there was a, a myth that came around, this is pre-internet, that someone had put razor blades in there and some kid had got cut to ribbons. And after that day, we weren't allowed to go on that hydro slide anymore. Um, with your local knowledge, w were there ever any razor blades on that hydro slide? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that rumour? That, that uh, sadly, was a very true story. And, of course, that... Actually... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and but the great thing is that slide's no longer there. There's a skate park there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right, hey Steve Williams, you're a great New Zealander. Thanks so much for your time today, mate. I really appreciate it. It's been an honour. Yeah, awesome. No, great to be on it. Good luck for the the show, and um, yeah, I'll be listening to your next guests. <laughs>